Hello, welcome to our class. Today we want to look at uh, Information Communication Technology Past Paper, Wednesday 6th, April 2022. So the, the paper has question, seven questions. We shall begin looking at question number one. So question number one is saying, explain factors to consider when selecting spreadsheet program. So what is a, a spreadsheet program? Uh, we looked at a spreadsheet. It's a program that is used for mathematical manipulation. There are very many types of spreadsheet programs. But suppose you want to purchase a, a spreadsheet program, the first thing that you look at is the price. So this, uh, the programs are available depending on uh, the price that uh, fits you. So first of all, you have to look at the amount of money that you have, and then you will select which uh, program uh, is, is, uh, is available for fit for you according to your pocket. Again, uh, you have to look at the hardware and software requirement. There are some softwares that are not compatible with all the hardware. So maybe a particular uh, spreadsheet program, let's say Excel, might be available but not compatible with your Mac uh, computer or Mac operating system. So you have to look for maybe uh, Windows 7 or Windows 10 that might be compatible uh, with your uh, with your computer. Again, we, we have to look at the capacity. So what is the capacity of, of this uh, spreadsheet program? So the capacity depends on the size uh, measured in megabytes or gigabytes. Some are bigger. Suppose you have a computer that has a small memory. For example, your operating system or, or is small in capacity. Then a bigger uh, spreadsheet software will make your computer slow. So uh, again, you must consider if the capacity of your memory is compatible with the capacity of, this, uh, of the spreadsheet software. So you have to check on the capacity. And also, you have to check on the ab uh, ability of the software to share information. One very important aspect of a spreadsheet software is to uh, enable the user to share uh, this uh, information that are stored in it between users. For example, we could have users in different locations in different computers connected or via a network. So if the uh, spreadsheet software is not limited or it's limited to, uh, to one or a desktop computer, then it might not meet the need of uh, a person who needs to share this information. Again, the spreadsheet software uses graphics. So graphics are images. They could be graphs. They could be uh, these images that are used for visualization of data. Visualization is very important for the help uh, the user to, or, or the person you know, that is uh, looking at your work to compare, to do comparison, or to understand some uh, trends in your in your data. Again, there are some spreadsheet software that are complicated, so you have to select a spreadsheet software that is easy. First of all, it, it must be easy for you to learn and and also to use. So uh, if you, you if you purchase a very complicated uh, spreadsheet software and you are a new user, then sometimes it might not be of better use for you. Uh, some uh, spreadsheet softwares are technical in nature. So you must also look for technical support. So technical support will help you or will aid wherever there is a problem. Maybe there are some technicalities that you cannot understand. Again, you can also look at the documentation. So the documentation will help you to look at the various aspects or the various windows of this spreadsheet software, well documented, and uh, you are able to follow up for any, uh, any technical uh, problem, you are able to come through it. Easy. So that's question one. So the question was requiring you to consider or to, to give or explain. So we talked about very many factors there. Uh, price, hardware and software requirement, capacity. We talked about information sharing, capability, graphics, ease of learning and use, technical support and also documentation. So the first question is done. The, parts, the, the next part of the same same question was saying explain the following terms as used in data security. So we know data, data uh, uh, they, they, they are facts that uh, have not been processed by the computer or a system in this case. So 
each and every organization or each and every country has uh, rules pertaining to data privacy or, or, or how this organization that deals with data should uh, handle data belonging to private persons, data belonging to organizations, data belonging to different, different sectors. The first term here that we meet in data security is privacy. So privacy requires that uh, data should not be accessed by any unauthorized person. For example, if I give my bio data, for example, my name, my age, gender, to an organization, data security requires that this information should not be disclosed to anybody that is not uh, in need of them or the person is not authorized. Again, we have what we call data integrity. So data integrity requires that information should not be altered during its transmission over the internet. So when the, uh, when the data or information is transmitted from point A to B or from one user to another, there is a high chance that this data could be intercepted by a, a person and it, it may reach the destination in another form or a format. To do away with that, sometimes people try to encrypt data, people try to use some uh, softwares that could, uh, could monitor the stream flow of data so that the data remains to be tackled. So data integrity inquires or it requires that information should not be altered. It should be in the same format that was, uh, was sent from the receiver to the sender. Again, we have what we call authenticity. Authenticity requires that there should be a mechanism to authenticate a user before giving them access to the required information. So how do you authenticate a user? For example, we could have users given different usernames and different different passwords. For example, at different levels, we could have administrator passwords. So it's just users having different passwords for their use on, on a system. So again, now the administrator is able to, to, to to trace or to train anybody who is using your system is able to know that a particular person is using which particular part of the system at a particular time because they are using uh, uh, they are using the passwords or the authentications that are given by the uh, by the administrator. Another one is what we call non-liquidation. So it is the protection against the denial of, of order or denial of payment. Once a sender sends a message. To the sender, <clears throat> this this message should not be uh, be denied. For example, I'll, I I make an order uh, to a particular company to provide for me or to provide me the, uh, a service. This uh, the, this this data security feature requires that I I, I must be uh, able to to validate or to, to prove that I send this message and should not be in a position to deny. Why? Because there is a Maybe something like, uh, let's say, a copy of, 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 of the request that was sent, sent to the sender, and also one remaining with you. So I should not be in a position to deny the fact that I sent the request. And again, it is a two way uh, traffic. The recipient also should not be able to deny the receipt. So if the recipient have received the order, you should not deny that they did not receive the order. So we, look, we looked at four, privacy, integrity, authenticity, and reputation are all terms that are used in data security, including all, all other terms that are used in data, data security. The third part of the question was asking about the advantages of code of ethics. So what, what are code of ethics, or what we call code of conduct? So we know, all know that each and, of an, each and every organization or a country have an agreed rules of a way that an employee or a, a particular person in that country should behave. For example, they should put on uh, in this particular manner, they should engage in this and this particular activity and not the other one. So these are what we call code of ethics. So these code of ethics are very important for organizations. Advantages of code of conduct. So the first advantage of uh, ethical code of conduct is that they en uh, enhance the right organizational culture by uh, factoring integrity, trust, and respect. It also provides a, a guide on people's behavior. So when we have rules uh, that are well laid down, that uh, guide how uh, 
uh, the people in an organization or the employees within an organization should carry out their, themselves, should behave, then uh, there are high chances that there must be trust and respect uh, because no employee will cross the line of another employee. And again, there will be a very good relationship between the employees themselves and the managers or the leaders that are above them. And again, uh, there, there, there will be a high, high, highly rated integrity within the organization. And again, number two is that it establishes a good image. So the people or the customers that are, are the stakeholders, they are very important stakeholders in this uh, organization, are able to, uh, uh, to, to, to rate the organization very well. They are able to, 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 to have a good reputation of the, of the organization because of these ethical values that, are, that, that might augur well with any member or any stakeholder within a, an organization. So remember, if there is a good relationship or if there is a good image of an organization, then probably or most preferably there will be good sales or there will be good turnout. Again, we have, uh, it enhances compliance with the law. So remember, we have laws that guide uh, organizational behavior or laws that guide <coughs> employees' behavior. So once we have ethical code of conduct within an organization, then it is very easy because remember this ethical conduct of, uh, or ethical code of conduct, uh, they are streamlined along uh, the law. So it is very easy for an employee or any other person that falls within uh, this code to also be in line with the, uh, the laws that guide the business or that guides uh, particular operation within an organization. Again, we have it promotes teamwork and productivity. So this one uh, comes about because there is a tr stronger relationship within the workspace. Remember, if we have a well-laid code of uh, ethics within an organization, then we say that the people within the organization are going to be coerced. They are going to have teamwork. And with teamwork, the productivity prop, uh, must go up because remember, these people are now working together and there's no one who is feeling demoralized or someone who will be feeling left out in a particular uh, in a particular duty like or line of duty. So those are the advantages of a code of ethics within an organization. Again, they also come with disadvantages. So uh, question D was asking the disadvantages of professional code of conduct. Remember, uh, the advantages far, so far outweighs the, the, the disadvantages. So in as much as the ethical code of conduct are very important and proper for an organization, they come with a cost. So the first point is that it, it, it leads to increased cost and low profits. Remember, if you uh, have to establish this ethical conduct, code of conduct, there, there will be a need for supervision. And sometimes this requires some costs, they require some resources, and these resources are, are part of, 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 of the finances that are part of the profit that this organization is looking up to. They are going to add uh, to the cost of running this business. So this cost will reduce the productivity of the business. Two, we also have loss of time. So companies, uh, employees sometimes or even the managers themselves may lose valuable time as they develop and implement professional code of conduct. So professional code of conduct do not come once, it's a process that takes some time most preferably. So this time that is required to engage in this thing or to come up with the, uh, or to, to, to collect information or from each and every stakeholder, remember you cannot just wake up and come up with, uh, with professional code of conduct. You have to engage each and every individual this will consume a lot of time and also it will, it will take uh, some preferable energy in implementing. So that's a, a, a disadvantage uh, of implementation of this ethical code of conduct. Also we have what we call lack of flexibility. Remember this code of conduct will, uh, will uh, rigidly put a particular employee within one line. So maybe they cannot cross the boundary to this particular place or to do this particular job because they will be working within a specified framework or within a specified limit of time and space. So it will, it will, it will deny the employees or it will restrict them to work in a straight line. 
and this sometimes will, uh, if you look at it keenly, it can limit some talents where a person could have been uh, uh, very well talented in another part, and because now of this code of conduct, they will be limited to be working in one particular line of duty. Question number E says, examine three impacts of the internet on the education sector. Examine three Im impacts of the internet on the education se sector. So, internet has really impacted the education sector today. The first advantage or the first impact that we all see is that it has enhanced what we call research. Right now, students are able to do research because uh, they are able to access uh, books online. They are able to uh, they are able to look, uh, to look for documents online. Uh, they are able to to to, to interact with uh, um, other researchers. They are able to interact with lecturers and professors over the internet. So because of that, uh, research has really really been enhanced. Also, we have what we call online schooling. Remember, you do not need to go within a four cornered building to interact with a physical teacher. Now we have virtual uh, studies or virtual learnings and you can be doing a course uh, uh, in, in, in Dar es Salaam and you stay in Mogadishu without physically attending the classes. So it has enhanced uh, online schooling which also has really really impacted the education sector. Also we have a uh, growth of talent. Remember uh, we have what we call the social media platforms for example, uh, we have the TikTok, uh, we have uh, the YouTube, and the rest. Uh, so, students who are talented in one area or another are able to, to upload their content, and this content are able to pay them well, and also they are able to share it out, and they are able to get directions from other people who feel that they are talented and are worthwhile. Again, we, uh, we talk about communication. Remember, right now, in an organization or a school setting, people are able to communicate easily by uh, using communication channels or such as Instagram, uh, WhatsApp is the most popular one, where students do not need to spend a lot of money on, on buying airtimes, but they can use these other social media networks to also communicate with each other or to communicate with their lecturers or to communicate with their, uh, uh, with, with, with their supervisors at different, different levels. So there are also very many other ways in which uh, uh, internet has impacted positively the education network. But in this case, we've talked about four major uh, uh, impacts that uh, the internet has uh, created in, uh, in the education sector. Mm -hmm.